Confetti Coverage Quicksand, Chapter 17, What Became of Me. Here is what became of me. The first thing that happened was that I immediately met the man who was to become my husband, and we started dating. We were both broke and didn't know what we were going to do with our lives, but we fell in love. The second thing that happened was that I realized I was in dire need of therapy, which was expensive. I paid for it in cash with my tips. Then I started attending church. That was the hardest of all. I wanted to strengthen my relationship with God, but I felt as if I would be struck by lightning even entering the building. I told God I would never do drugs again, and I never did. I'm sure you want more of an explanation than that, but that was really it. I made that decision, and I stuck to it. I saved up some money and took some computer classes to try and build my skills. Then I went to a temp agency and they were cool enough to let me come in an hour before work every day and do tutorials on their computers free of charge. So I took tons of notes on all of the computer programs. I had a yellow legal tablet filled with directions on how to use all the programs. I never went out on the temp assignments they offered me because it was always only a day or two, and I needed a real job where I could actually pay my bills. I asked my journalist friend from work, Robbie, if I could pick her brain about careers. She sat me down and told me to go to UCLA to take some night classes. UCLA? I mean, how could I even get in there? She explained they offered special programs called extension classes. You could just pay the fee for the class and go. I didn't need to be accepted to the school or pay a huge tuition. She asked me a bunch of questions and told me it sounded like I should go out for public relations. I signed myself up and asked questions later. I was petrified to drive out to UCLA and walk on the campus. I didn't know where anything was. I didn't know what to wear. I was so scared, I thought they would laugh me right out of there. I was floored that my legs were moving me across beautiful manicured lawns. I couldn't believe it. I found parking. I found my class in the beautiful old buildings. I sat down amongst the other students and I felt okay. I liked the instructor, Jeff Duclos, who was from Rogers and Cowan, a very prominent PR firm. The class sounded interesting when he explained what it would be about. And as it went on, I found I seriously liked the class. I felt challenged, which made me feel overjoyed. I felt like I was doing something I could be proud of. I did reports on things I was interested in. I did research. I even spoke in front of the class. It took six or seven more classes. They were mostly communication and writing classes, how to deal with different types of people. One of them was crisis and reputation management. One was writing for the press. One was publicity management. There were a bunch of neat classes with great speakers that came in and taught us how to gently let people down if you didn't like something, how to get people on the phone, how to get somebody to read your email, how to deal with people in meetings, how to get someone to pay attention to your project, pitch people. It was a crash course in business, plain and simple. I was starting to accumulate skills that could be used at a real job. And I remember when I left the school and I was tearing down sunset to the 405 in the dark, I would scream with happiness. My heart was filled with pride and joy. I went to the UCLA bookstore and bought a book on job interviews and studied every question and what a good answer would be. I realized after reading it that I had been going about my past interviews all wrong. I had had no clue. I couldn't believe I had ever gotten a job with the things I used to say on interviews. I put together a pathetic resume and Allison took it to someone she knew at a big corporation. And the next thing I knew, I had an interview. I had to ace it. I had to. I was dying, just dying to get out of the restaurant business. They were about to fire me for a bad attitude. I couldn't even pretend anymore. I wanted to leave so desperately. Two women interviewed me a few days later. 
I was so happy just to be there. I was beaming. I almost did a kickball change and some jazz hands. They asked me many of the questions that were in the book I studied, so I had prepared answers. I said the right things. Me! I got a call later that day, and it was a job offer. I fell into a heap on the floor because I couldn't believe it. It was all over. I was no longer a waitress. I was determined, more determined than I have ever been in my entire life, to make something of myself. I vowed I would not fuck up this chance. Most people hated offices, but I was thrilled to walk into one. I was so happy to be away from screaming kids and club sandwiches. If my job was taping paper together, then damn it, I was going to be the best paper taper known to man. The average was 50 per hour. Okay, well, I'll do 75. I felt lucky to be at a place where there was a chance of actual advancement and a chance to have a career. I studied the professional look. It was a new creation, just like the others I had created, and I knew I had one shot to get it right. I had to look the part. I opened a charge card at a boring store and bought three pencil skirts in black, gray, and camel. Then I bought three collared shirts, black, white, and gray, that went with the skirts. I went and bought some good shoes, a camel pair and a black pair, closed toe, not too high, and I eventually accumulated a beautifully groomed wardrobe. As a matter of fact, I was completely overdressed for my position. I dressed nicer than the managers did. I had mainly female managers, so I hid any part of me that would not be deemed professional or that would cause another female to not like me or to want to compete with me or take me down out of jealousy. That meant wearing my long hair up in a perfect bun every single day, hiding my figure, not dressing cute or stylish, and appearing very conservative at all times. I knew I was doing something right because my co-workers tried to give me shit. One older woman told me, don't bother dressing up. It doesn't matter. You'll never get promoted here. I've been here for years. Nobody sees us here. You might as well be comfortable. She looked like refried hell every day in sweats, moping around and smoking cigarettes. It was true. Everybody was in jeans and sweats. We were not visible to any executives. They were in the main headquarters across town in a showy new high-rise building with marble lobbies, elevators, and people in suits. We were in a rundown warehouse, really, a debilitated one-story building in an industrial area littered with trash near porn studios. The place was not visible to the bigwigs. Well, I tried to remain positive. I read a book called How to Be a CEO, which touched on the positive attitude and other traits of a CEO. I started to buy tons of other books on business etiquette, speech, climbing a corporate ladder, and taking initiative. And I studied those books relentlessly. I was determined to crack the code of moving up that corporate ladder. The books told me things I had never even considered, from do not lean against anything to do not wear perfume because you risk offending somebody who doesn't like the scent. You could lose a client. Have a firm, but not too firm, of a handshake, all that stuff. I studied the language of business and the pitfalls many women often make. For instance, don't say, I feel that we should blah, 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 never uh, bring feelings into business. I read books on how to play hardball in business, how to formally dine with clients, how to shine in meetings, how to deal with difficult people, how to get noticed on a team, how to do this, how to do that. I read every single book I could get my manicured hand on, no French tips or loud colored nails only short, very light, pale pink nails. I studied business writing. I took every single class the company offered and posted all the certificates in my cubicle. While my coworkers had Winnie the Pooh coffee mugs, cut out comic strips, kitten calendars, and pictures of their kid everywhere, I had a very deliberate set created. A row of books, a green desk lamp, one small ivy plant, an American flag, I was friendly to everyone, not too friendly, didn't want to be seen as a social butterfly and not taken seriously, and I did my work as perfect and as quickly as possible. 
I continued studying every aspect of being promotable. I joined special groups and teams to try to gain visibility. I volunteered for special projects. I wrote for the newsletter. I was never late to the job and I never called in sick unless I was dying. I never left early. Every move was calculated and designed for promotion. I just remember always saying, sure, I can do that. And then running to the phone and calling Allison and asking her how to do things. Like, how do I use a fax machine again? How do I use a copier? She walked me through every single thing. I sat at my computer and learned every program that I could that I hadn't already learned at that, at that, uh, that one place. Anyway, I learned every shortcut that was available. Lazy was I no longer. I did everything as excellent as I could and kept my eye on the prize. I didn't really know what I wanted to do as my next position. Kind of had no idea what half of the positions even entailed. I just knew I had to get to the next position above the one I was in, whatever that was. It's stapling two pieces of shit together? Fine, I'll take the job and be the best shit stapler there is, as long as it makes more money and gets me one more step up the ladder. I was totally psycho. So after about six months, I got a small raise. It was 30 cents or something like that. Then, about six months later, I got another little raise and changed positions. I excelled at that job and I tried for a position a little higher. My coworkers still insisted that the most you could get was a 50 cent increase a year. I thought, no, no, not me. This is me we're talking about. I don't read just one book on a subject. I read 15. I didn't play house as a girl. I ran an empire. I took everything I ever did and ran with it, even being a loser. I couldn't just be sort of a loser. I was a monumental loser, so scoot the fuck out of my way and let me hurry up and take over this entire company, okay? Well, a year passed. I was making more than the people around me due to some extra merit increases here and there. Some of the higher-ups felt I was moving too fast, and I was called in for a meeting with the director of something or other. She said she didn't feel I was ready to move up any further, and if I were to do so, it would only harm me. She didn't want to set me up to fail, quote-unquote. Set me up to fail? I smiled serenely with my hands in my lap, legs crossed at the ankle, I eyeballed her Disney mug, her calendar of cute animals, and her outfit from Lane Bryant, and I assured her that I was not going to fail. I thanked her for her concern, and I went on my merry way. The path wouldn't be through her. I was going to have to move around her. There was finally an opening in the big, visible, high-rise headquarters location. I immediately applied, interviewed, and was hired for a bigger position. I excelled at the job and asked for the hardest accounts they had. And next thing I knew, I was managing million dollar accounts for the company. I got another raise, then another, then another. Two years later, I was in a management position in that high rise building. I had taken my boss's job. I was in charge of a team of 12 people. Some of them my co former co-workers. A few had college degrees and were far more educated than I was, but they didn't have the drive I had. Part balls, part determination, and a dash of crazy. I continued to study business and coach to many people on my team on interviewing for higher positions, how to represent themselves professionally, how to move up and make more money. I saw that director of something or other in the elevator one day. I smiled serenely once again. I knew that she was aware of my staggering growth in the company and the new position I held. I barreled right past her and her advice. She knew it and I knew it. As someone who I can't remember once said, the greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. Well, I ended my career at the big corporation four years after my start date. If I had listened to the women around me, I would have made only two more dollars an hour than when I first started. Instead, I was salaried and had increased my earnings by exactly 100%. I left that job for another company at a Fortune 500 company who offered me five figures more a year than I was making. I was determined to continue on my quest to better myself. 
I read so many books that my eyes nearly fell out. I read classic literature, studied politics, world history, current events. I also read countless books on psychology, especially on alcoholic families and families of addicts. I studied etiquette book after etiquette book until I was having dreams about table settings and proper introductions. In hindsight, it was certainly overkill. But coming from the life I did, I just needed it. I wanted that formal training. I wanted to feel prepared in any social situation. I never wanted to turn down a job because I was afraid of the people around me. I never wanted to avoid walking into a room of established people because I felt inferior. I never wanted to be nervous dining at a table with someone important. I never wanted to feel uncomfortable walking into an upscale store. I wanted to make sure I could hold a conversation with anyone, anywhere. I was falling more and more in love with the man I was to marry who had grown in his own career during the time I had grown in mine. He proposed to me and we were married the next year in a big church wedding. We bought a place, decided to get all new stuff. We threw out every crappy thing from my old apartment, mismatched silverware, years of hand-me-downs, scratched dressers, stained couches, 1970s tables, chipped cups and old towels. I threw them all away. We bought beautiful new things, a soft, comfortable couch with lots of Italian wool pillows, thick crystal vases filled with white flowers, smooth, beautiful plates and fat glasses and a clean stainless steel fridge, no more moldy used fridge, beautiful cherry wood office furniture, thick monogrammed towels in the bathroom, new soft sheets and blankets and plushy pillows on the bed. I was stunned at my new life, making snow angels in my new sheets. I was in love, happy, and proud of myself. Soon, I had a little golden baby, quit working, and we moved to the beach right by the ocean. Are you sick to your stomach yet? Of my good luck? Well, don't be. Within a year, I found a lump in my breast that turned out to be stage two, almost stage three breast cancer. And I did the strongest chemotherapy treatments available. I was sitting there in the chemo place with a bunch of old people thinking, what am I doing here? Talk about getting comfortable with yourself. Try looking at yourself bald. I'm not ready to write about cancer. I, I just can't. Not yet. All I can say is that it took me shaving the rest of my hair off, the clumps that were left after the chemo killed the rest, to look myself in the eyes and love myself. I finally looked at the real me. I looked into my own eyes, into my own soul, and I saw a woman who wasn't just hair and makeup. I saw a strong person who I respected and admired. As I write this, my hair has just grown in long enough for me to finally be done with wigs, and I haven't given up. You are now listening to my book. Which brings me to the last thing I'm going to say, dear reader. As the saying goes, it is never too late to become the person you were meant to be. <laughs>